This is Robert Stark. Uh, I am uh, here with uh, Eugene uh, Monsovat. Uh, Eugene, uh, it's uh, nice having you on. Thank you. So uh, we are going to be discussing uh, some of your articles. You have you've written a number of articles for uh, Countercurrents Publishing, and you also have yeah. a blog of your own. Tell us a little bit about yourself, just sort of a brief bio. Well, I live in New York, but I was raised in the northeastern United States, sort of a uh, white working class background. I was fortunate enough to go to college. I did not study anything like philosophy or sociology, geopolitics, anything like that, but I focused on technology, computer science, and I was sort of introduced to the roots of my philosophical worldview that I currently have through exposure to the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche. And from Nietzsche, his influence on the German conservative revolutionary movement, figures like uh, Oswald Spengler, Ernst Jünger, Anthony Nikisch, Arthur Moeller Vandenbroek. And from the German conservative revolution, I was exposed to the French New Right, particularly my favorite figure in that milieu. Alain de Benoit, and from Alain de Benoit, Alexander Dugan, who is probably my largest philosophical and geopolitical influence at this time. And uh, you, your blog is on uh, the blog you translate articles uh, from de Benoit. Yes, my my blog is um, the Ernst Nikisch translation project. Right now, I'm working to translate a book called Hitler of the Tauke Almond also actually National Bolshevik uh Hitler on German fate and other national Bolshevik writings which were published variously in the twenties and thirties by Ernst Nikisch. Uh right now I'm translating the preface by Alain de Benoit. So it's a fairly long preface. I'm doing a couple pages each upload. And this blog is essentially focused on how national Bolshevism was articulated by Ernst Nikisch in his magazine, Biederstein. Ernst Jünger was also a contributor. So it's a very interesting look at the politics of the Weimar Republic, particularly the intersection between class struggle and national struggle, something I've focused on in my writings elsewhere. I think the article that really sort of uh, caught my attention, and uh, this is probably this is your article. This is posted up on Countercurrents, and it's called uh, "Turn Left, uh, New Right." But uh, first of all, uh, you, you talked about your sort of introduction to a lot of those different thinkers. Uh, how would you sort of uh, summarize and explain the concept of the new right to someone who's uh, Say never heard of it before. Well, the new right's a very broad term, and in many ways it's a misnomer. I would consider it something that's beyond right and left, something that's against the political categories of today. It is against modernity, globalization, the homogenization of the world's cultures, and for a rooted existence for all people. I would consider that the clearest goal of the new right would be to give all people the chance to live in a society that represents their traditional culture. And that is basically the premise of your, the premise of your article. Uh, I want to call, ask you uh, that you saw that blog, but there's a blog called, uh, but I'm a liberal and uh, yeah, it, it actually, I'm not that familiar with the the blogger, but I, that that caught my attention. I, I read that. his uh, review of my work, and it's interesting that some leftist has taken an interest in this work. And I think what is often called the new right has very <clears throat> much to offer to the old left, the left that was focused on the class struggle, the left that was focused on the life of the worker, like right? the old left has been abandoned essentially by the new left, which is given up on this class struggle that was so essential for a hundred years of leftist struggle going back to 
socialism, Marx, etc., and has adopted this uh, sort of identity politics, which is did perfectly you, complementary with capitalism. Did you personally uh, start off on being influenced by the old left before you discovered these other thinkers like uh, De Benoit and uh, Dugan? Well, the old left influence really comes to me from personal experience. I mean, I come from a working class background, and my father was a is a union member, but he always felt very alienated by the way the modern left viewed the working class, especially the white working class in America. So they were reactionary bigots and such, and they had given up on trying to, say, prevent globalization, oppose free trade, oppose outsourcing or mass immigration that would undercut the wages of the workers. So left in America has given up on creating a better life for workers and is simply catering to the identity groups that are essentially the result of bourgeois and wage. They're, they're bored of rich liberals who need to express themselves through deviant forms of sexuality or whatnot. And economic, economically, that's totally – they're totally in line with uh, what uh, – what, what you're saying is capitalism. Yes. The, the left today is totally in line with capitalism, whereas the new right sees capitalism as a threat to the traditional identities of people. Capitalism seeks to erase borders. They seek to expand profits as much as possible and – Ultimately, they want access to the world as a global market. Ultimately, the goal of capitalism is globalization. To achieve globalization, you can use multiculturalism, you can use free trade, you can break down whatever barriers exist between the flow of goods, services, and labor between nations, peoples, etc. So you would say that most of these problems that are discussed, the root cause of it is is economic. Why the root cause is spiritual, really, but that it has an economic manifestation. The issue is that we've placed material good over spiritual good. We've become a culture of greed, a culture of consumerism, and this manifests itself as unrestrained capitalism. Your article, you mentioned, it's you're important to point out, you said that communism is uh, dead. A lot of, I, I think the main critique that if you listen to uh, like uh, the Tea Party and uh, AM Talk Radio, it's that uh, like Obama and the modern left are communist. You, you hear that a lot. Why, they're absolutely not communists. They, they're in the pocket of corporations, and of course they use big government to aid their friends in business. They're, they're not really focusing on replacing the corporate elite with the proletariat. They're focused on aiding the corporate elite using the power of government. Did the Cold War make class politics uh, relevant? Why, it's certainly not, because the class struggle is as alive today as it is was in the past, perhaps even more so with the domination of the financial oligarchy over the globe. There's really only a few nations on the world that are able to resist the power of financial oligarchy, and they have their own problems with it. So it didn't make struggle irrelevant. However, it did influence the thinking of the nations, especially in the Western bloc and the capitalist bloc, that the concept of class struggle had been defeated at the end of the Cold War. So by the end of the Cold War, this, this capitalist triumphalism infected the minds of the West, and it said that Class struggle is no longer relevant. If you believe in class struggle, you believe in some antiquated ideology. And in your article, you point out, you say that uh, leftists 
leftist financiers have advanced uh, their their global agenda. You see that the right has been mirrored in like petty concerns, and the Cold War being a major. You're saying the Cold War was a major distraction of the uh, uh, conservatives or the right in the Anglosphere. Yes, yeah, certainly, because all it did was advance the agenda of the rich financiers who couldn't care about the actual state of the nation. They merely cared about their own profits. They weren't nationalists. They were capitalists, and capital has no nation. And so you see it today with these large left-wing financiers who are advancing all this anti-traditional life, lifestyle. Like uh, George like Soros, George basically. Soros, for example. Yes. Yeah. And you say that uh, liberals use petty petty racial and religious bigotries of nationalists to justify their agenda of uh, combating the Islamification of Europe. Why you see this with, uh, in England, you have the EBL, which is pro-Zionist, pro-gay. It's against the traditional English society. And it seeks to take the anger of the common English people that should be directed at the politicians supporting the globalization that leads to mass immigration and focus it on the victims of globalization, the immigrants themselves. And you, you see it as well in Ukraine where you have these radical nationalists who are merely being used as pawns of NATO oligarchy to destroy the Russian influence, commit genocide of the Russian population so that Ukraine can be integrated into the EU and enjoy all the benefits that Western liberalism has to offer it. And you see uh, the root cause, you see, yeah, the root causes of, uh, in this case, in Europe, but in the same here, the root causes of Islamic immigration are ignored while their oh, supporters yes. are freed from culpability. Yes, the root causes are ignored. I, I think especially in England, which is so rooted in capitalism that the finger is pointed on the Muslims themselves and not on the financiers, the government, the Zionists who continue to wage war throughout the Middle East, uprooting all of these communities and turning these people into refugees. Why, if Philly wanted to oppose mass Islamic immigration, they should align themselves with the Arab socialists, the Arab nationalists, people like Gaddafi or Assad or Nasser in the past, who wanted to provide a nationalism for their own people that would provide basic standards of education, health, welfare, so these people wouldn't have to leave their own countries. But instead, the West has taken the side of these sheiks and, and fundamentalists who are totally in the pocket of Western corporations who will commit... So their, their, basic, their basic hypocrisy is uh, in the Middle East is they oppose secular leaders uh, who are in opposition... Secular leaders who are in opposition to globalization, but they, they have no problem aligning themselves with... Uh, Wahhabi fundamentalists, as long as they, as long as those countries or groups do business with uh, multinational corporations, that's basically what you're saying. Like countries like absolutely, Saudi Arabia, absolutely. Saudi Arabia is a, the perfect case. And that's where most of this. most of the funding for groups like uh, ISIS is coming from. Yes, and support. Of course, ISIS. Its predecessor organizations like Al Nusra Front and the Free Syrian Army were not only backed by the Saudis but backed by American dollars as well. So there's multiple levels of American influence indirectly through the Saudis and directly with people like John McCain flying in to meet with these people who would eventually destroy ancient monuments and decapitate, murder, and rape. Yeah, I mean, they wouldn't, if it wasn't for, uh, our, I mean, ISIS wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for our policies in both Syria and the war in Iraq. Yes, yeah, as I said before, 
the Free Syrian Army, Al Nusra Fund, all these supposedly moderate sources of resistance to Assad evolved into ISIS. They were directly funded by the United States. They have the open backing of major U.S. politicians. And the, the forces opposing this were the groups that are demonized by the U.S., Iran, Hezbollah, Assad. So it's, it's really a great geopolitical game the U.S. is playing. They're going to use these militant Wahhabists to destroy their enemies. Well, first of all, you describe you describe uh, Syria as a secular country, and Iran you describe it as a conservative country, but not fundamentalist. Uh, what are so what are the, what are the primary reasons that the Western oligarchy views those particular uh, regimes and nations as such a threat? You list uh, Syria, Iran, uh, Gaddafi's Libya, Hezbollah, because they don't really seek to integrate themselves into the Western liberal system. They seek to have their own self-contained forms of nationalism. And thus, in many ways, their, their markets would be closed off. Their people wouldn't have access to the joys of MTV and McDonald's and such. And this is simply unacceptable to the United States. The, the fundamental idea of Western liberalism is that every nation wants to be and deserves to be like the United States. And if it doesn't, it's obviously a threat to world peace, a enemy of democracy and freedom. It, liberalism is really today the most supremacist ideology on the globe. And any nation that resists it will be labeled a rogue state and be threatened with destruction if it doesn't come to heel at the U.S. behest. Basically, you don't. You mean by liberalism, uh, you mean basically modernity and the uh, plutocracy and globalization. You don't necessarily mean uh, stereotypically like liberalism in the way that an American conservative would use. Why? Yes. Why liberalism is the ideology of the Enlightenment. So everything after the Enlightenment is, is essentially influenced by liberalism or a reaction to liberalism. So American conservatism, what we call conservatism in America, is really a form of liberalism. It accepts uh, representative democracy and capitalism and other things that are hallmarks of essentially enlightenment thought. And uh, in your article, Turn Left, New Right, uh uh, have you also get into the importance of uh, ec economics and yeah. econo economic views? So the fight against liberalism is necessarily a fight against capitalism. So there needs to be opposition to free trade. There needs to be opposition to globalization. There needs to be support for the workers to be a communal ethos because that nationalism is a form of communitarianism and that implies a certain level of socialism that you have to be responsible for the other people in your nation. Kind of an economic uh, policy, uh, would you would you advocate, advocate uh, would you advocate sort of, are you talking about classical uh, Marxism? Or more sort no, of alternative. There's a, no like alternative, something like distributism, basically. This, why I'm very interested in things like distributism, uh, social credit, national Bolshevism, uh, Peronism, corporatism. What, what we meant, it, what would be fall under the umbrella of third position thought, which merges a sort of nationalist or even hierarchical viewpoint with a communitarian ethos. So I, I don't see how we'll ever eliminate the inequalities between people, but I believe that there's a way to unify people through economics, through a common shared goal. And I think the integral nationalism 
I think there's sort of a yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a false dichotomy that the only alternatives are the current system of plutocracy and, and like radical, as opposed to like radical uh, egalitarianism where everyone is forced to be equal. Yes, it's it's a false dichotomy that's perpetuated by the uh, media, essentially that. Oh, there's no alternative to capitalism. Why we we can sort of fidget around with it and sort of have a bigger welfare state or a smaller welfare state, but there's there's no uh, way around globalization or free trade or mass immigration. So, what you really have, especially after <clears throat> the fall of communism, was formerly hard left parties started advocating sort of the Nordic model of capitalism, which is essentially free market capitalism, but with a strong welfare state. And that's really not the communitarian ethos I'm looking at. I'm looking at things like Perón's Argentina, where the idea of man as a social being manifested itself economically that one could have autonomy over oneself, one could own a house, but the purpose of one's life was to serve the community. And either an extreme neoliberalism or the, the soft neoliberalism of the Nordic welfare model, they're still rooted in this individualist model where the purpose of one's life is to satisfy oneself, it's not to serve the community true socialism is about sacrifice. It's about bringing one's goals to the service of the greater good, to the service of the nation. And uh, you reviewed that book, uh, Kerry Bullen's book, uh, On Peyron. Uh, I You also reviewed his other book, Revolution, Revolution from Above. Oh, no, no, that, that not that one. Uh, Babel Inc. And I interviewed him on my website on both of those two different books. Yes. Uh, I enjoy Kerry Bolton a lot because unlike many writers in the Anglosphere who see nationalism primarily about race and IQ, he focuses on the economic aspect, which is very important because without the economic sovereignty of the nation, there is no way of forcing any sort of nationalism. So unless a nation can withdraw from the international system and achieve autonomy over itself, it's going to be at the beck and call of international financiers. I think with the, you mentioned Kerry Bolden, I think um, there's not that many people really addressing the economic issues, even on a site like Countercurrents, uh, it's not talked about. I think Kerry Bolden's like the only writer on Countercurrents who really emphasize, who makes that his main focus. Well, I think it's a problem of the Anglosphere in general. Because the Anglosphere is so tied up with 19th century liberalism and scientific rationalism, it's very much focused on biological definitions of race and things like IQ and what we would call human biodiversity. I'm not saying those things aren't important, but I don't think that it's necessary to focus on. So they just talk nonstop about race. I think that's uh, that, that's basically with a huge segment. That's all they talk about. Yes, it's it's not really necessary to put out all this information about race. I mean, people are naturally aware of the differences. We've known that there are differences between ethnicities since the dawn of time. Why the idea that we need to simply just put out all these scientific or even pseudoscientific works that continuously churn them out is not necessary for nationalism. Why nationalism arises through a spiritual feeling. It's not going to come through a rational scientific analysis of the biological differences between certain groups. 
thing that I think is a bit that is real a big distraction is a lot of the there's a lot of uh, kind of crude nationalism where people view people of other they view other nationalities or ethnicities as the enemy as opposed to uh, the plutocracy. That's absolutely true. Uh, we have, especially on the issue of immigration where we have the tendency to look at the immigrants and say, ah, they're the problem. The immigrants are not the problem. They are also victims as much as the people of the native land. Why the problem is the global plutocracy. And I think this, this petty nationalism to look at other nations as the enemy is a tool of the global plutocracy. It says, oh, look at these petty nationalists. They're always fighting. Therefore, we need internationalism. Therefore, we need open borders. Therefore, we need liberalism, and we need to eliminate any patriotic sentiment. So what I really support is the liberation of all people and the right of all people to pursue their traditional cultures against the internationalists. It is not nation versus nation, but nationalism versus internationalism. And uh, you also have this, all your other article is uh, about the necessity of anti-colonialism. Yes. Like, anti-colonialism, I think, is one of those left-wing causes that has been abandoned and needs to be taken up by the new right. Like, if we, if we support national liberation for all peoples, of course we're going to have to support the liberation of Palestine, the liberation of uh, Libya, the liberation of Burkina Faso, and all these all these various post-colonial places that are essentially under the heel of the financial oligarchy. I think many people, especially in former imperial nations, have this nostalgia for empire, and that's a very bad thing. Why the the common people of Britain did not gain from the British Empire. They were cannon fodder, and in many cases, the poor British, the Scottish, the Irish were shipped off as white slaves to America, something that's not very often addressed. You saw this in Australia, where the British colonial powers wanted to undercut the wages of the white Australians with uh, immigrant labor from Asia. So the victims of the British colonial system are white people as well as non-whites. And the beneficiaries of the colonial system were the international capitalists who didn't care about their own people who who eventually saw that the old imperial model of great powers competing against each other was impeding their ability to trade internationally. And so they replaced the old great power colonialism of, say, Britain and France with international neocolonialism, of course, based out of the global financial centers in the United States, London, etc. And I don't think that many people view this hijacking of patriotism for the purpose of financial gain. And I really wanted to like city of anti-colonialism. What you're getting at, and this is the point Kerry Bolden made in his book as well, is that the current system that we have today of multinational corporations uh, is really just an offshoot of uh, original uh, colonialism. It is. It is. Why colonialism is a mercantile ideology. It is like brave exploration or seeking to conquer nature. I mean, it has certain facets that reflect that. But ultimately, the goal of colonialism is to seek profit. And it's this colonial ideology is rooted in the same greed as modern neoliberalism, modern neocolonialism. And I, I addressed the sort of spiritual crisis in the West that led to this, where you saw the decline of feudalism, which was a system governed by values. 
and it was replaced by mercantilism and colonialism, which were materialistic values. And so this, this will to take is really a sign of the spiritual decline of nations, and it ultimately destroys nations. And uh, you also get back to, you said alternatives, you give example of uh, Libya's, Libya's uh, Muammar Gaddafi as an example of someone who, who's in opposition to this. And yes. uh, other examples right. you gave, uh, Egypt's uh, Nasser, uh, Juan Perón. Why these, these figures essentially wanted to assert their own forms of socialism to provide for their people, to break them out of the domination of Western powers, and also very, very importantly, the geopolitical aspects. They wanted to bring the nations around them into an alliance against their common colonial exploiters. The major issue facing the nations that reject modern capitalism, U.S. imperialism, Zionism, is that they find themselves isolated, and so they can simply be embargoed and sanctioned until their economy collapses or there's a revolution due to economic circumstances. So it's necessary for the nations fighting against colonialism to align with one another so they can trade and provide mutual aid with one another. Hugo Chavez, in his concept of the Bolivarian Alliance, is a good example of this. And I'm very hopeful that his goals continue to live. I know Venezuela is under a lot of pressures the United States is waging economic warfare, and so it's necessary for the other Bolivarian nations to provide aid to Venezuela. And uh, in your article, you you talk about uh, Francis Parker uh, Yaki, and I and I think he was the original. He was basically the the first, and basically he's someone who's very he's pretty obscure, like very outside of uh, the new right sphere. Uh, very few people know who he is. But uh, he yeah. was unique in the right when, in the sense that he was outspoken, very much outspoken against uh, American imperialism uh, at that at that time. Yes, and he, he was basically very also he was a very yeah he's a very forward think, thinker and he saw actually he pointed out that Europe was a victim of American imperialism because most people on the right were very much supportive of American imperialism, but he had more yes. of an influence in Europe, I would say, than in, uh, in the United States. His influence was uh, was totally non-existent, but I think he had a stronger influence in Europe. Yes, he had a much larger influence in Europe. And like, his idea was that Western Europe had essentially become a U.S. colony, and so he wanted to rally the people under NATO occupation to form their own geopolitical bloc, much like what Nasser wanted to do in Egypt. In fact, he later worked for Nasser, and so his ideas had an influence on that as well. So he saw the goal of Europe as coming together to forge their own destiny and kick out the American invaders. And he saw with the Arab nationalists who also wanted to form their own pan-Arab national bloc as exemplifying the same struggle. He later lived in Egypt. So uh, Yaki was really influential on both the pan-European and the pan-Arabist and against what he saw as the Zio american Empire. And he was very forward-thinking, as you mentioned, because so few people recognized that they were still wedded to the old colonial powers. They were still wedded to anti-communism, which he eventually saw as sort of a false flag, really, something that could distract the American right from the problems of international Zionism. And uh, in this article, you get back to, you get back to the conflict uh, in Syria and uh, what's going on there right now. And, uh, you talk a lot. You also talk about. You mention uh, Gaddafi and you mention uh, Bashar Assad. Yes, why Assad is 
obviously one of these figures that survived from this sort of Arab nationalist father was father was a representative of this current Hafez al-Assad. And his regime is sort of a throwback to this Nasserist idea that Yaki was influential in. And so obviously he's being targeted for keeping this flame alive. And what is the role uh, that, uh, that Saudi Arabia plays in all this? Well, Nasser said to first liberate all of Jerusalem, we must liberate Riyadh. He was perfectly aware that Saudi Arabia was the dupe of Western power. The, the Saudi nation really comes to existence because of their alignment with the British against the Ottomans in the First World War. And so the Saudis, from their inception as a regional power, were in bed with the West. And of course, they had their very virulent fundamentalist strain of Islam that absolutely intolerant towards the, not only other Muslims, but also the Christians and the various Druze and Yazidi sects of the region. So this this power, which combines sort of the most uh, backwards views on religion with a very cozy relation with the British and the, the power that supplanted the British, the United States, becomes this very strong weapon in the hands of Western imperialism because they can rally these violent fundamentalists at, to the call of Western imperialism. So essentially they're using this violent fundamentalist strain as a tool for the United States to destroy Syria, to destroy Hezbollah, to destroy Iran. You, you saw it with the Saudis funding the Bosnian Mujahideen in the 90s against uh, Serbia. So the, the Saudis were essentially going out of their way to a NATO war against a nation that rejected modern liberalism. And uh, the other factor is that those nations are uh, allied with Russia, and Russia plays a major uh, role in all this. In your article, you get into you get into uh, Putin, and you talk about the role that Putin played in uh, cleaning cleaning up a lot of the mess that uh, Yeltsin created in Russia when he was in power. Yes, why Putin is a very interesting figure. I mean, he was brought to power essentially to clean up the mess left by Yeltsin. And, and he sort of recognized that the, left, left, the mess left by Yeltsin was a direct result of Russia's subservience to the West. And he has increasingly moved away from the West. He has sought to reassert Russia as a great power. And this reassertion of Russian power also comes with a reassertion of a Russian cultural identity, the resurgence of orthodoxy, uh, reproachment with the church, why his increasingly uh, traditional stances on homosexuality, feminism, etc. And so Russia has taken a large power that was brought to its knees by the West, and Putin has taken a large power that was brought to its knees by the West, and raises it up. Uh, he's, he's sort of learned on the job. I don't think he expected to turn towards the West when he first turned against the West, when he first came to power. But I think he's come to realize that to assert Russian power, you must assert a unique Russian identity that is against the West. And so he's aligned himself with these other nations that reject Western liberalism, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, Cuba, because Russia is such a large and geopolitically important player, it's become the linchpin of this resistance against modern liberalism, against America. And so to destroy all of these smaller players, the U.S. targets Russia as well, because it's the prime mover behind this upsurge 
in the assertion of traditional national identities. And one more thing you you point out in this article, the necessity of anti-colonialism, is uh, the current situation we have. Uh, it, I mentioned earlier with how the current multinational corporations got their start in tradition, orig- traditional colonialism. Is that yeah? You mentioned that the first multinational corporation was the Dutch uh, East India Company. Yes. So. All of these things are precedented. All the things we're seeing today, foreign interventionism for the sake of corporate greed, is not a new phenomenon at all. I mean, the, the Dutch East India Company was backed by large banking interests, why it had the authority even to declare war. So all this foreign adventurism for corporate gain is a very old concept. And this is Dutch form of capitalism spread to England through the glorious revolution. And from England you get this great explosion of liberalism in the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution that implants itself in America. And so you have a direct line going back to Dutch capitalism to American multinational corporations. Um, I guess is there anything is there anything else you like to add about either of those two articles that uh, we didn't get a chance to touch upon? Oh, I'd like to discuss a little bit of my work on uh, national Bolshevism and their sneakish. Now, national Bolshevism, when when an American person encounters it, it's in many ways such a mind-blowing thing. It's like, how how can such a radical form of socialism also be radically nationalist? And so it's, it's such an alien and obscure idea to the American people, but it's in many ways the focal point for a new resistance against liberalism by merging the ideas of radical socialism with the ideas of radical nationalism. Now, the the figure I've become very interested in recently is Ernst Nikisch, who started off as an old social and social democrat. But after Germany's defeat in the First World War, he saw that the same people who were oppressing the working class were also repressing the nation that the rich had signed on to this Versailles Treaty and they were reaping the benefits of the Weimar Republic while veterans and the poor were experiencing inflation, were having to scrounge for food. So he come up, he eventually developed a synthesis between radical socialism and radical nationalism in a magazine called Widerstand, Resistance. And he saw that elites of the German society, the elite rich, were collaborators in the international order. They were essentially selling out the nation at Versailles. And so he advocated a sort of socialist revolution that would also be a nationalist revolution. That to, to free the nation also implied to free the working class from the trader class. And geopolitically, he was also very interesting because he advocated a turn towards the East. He wanted to bring a sort of social nationalist to Germany and align it with Russia, not so much like a total union between the Soviet Union and Germany, but a geopolitical alliance of two nations that were against Anglo-liberalism. And you saw this very interesting sort of group of people, Ernst Euler was involved in it. They go to Russia under the uh, an organization called ARPLAN, A-R-P-L-A-N, the Association for the Study of the Russian Planned Economy. And it's a German acronym. And so they're, they're trying to build bridges between the Soviet Union and Germany. And bring this 
nationalist orientation in line with a socialist orientation, why Nikish was a bit critical of, of the original form of Marxism as articulated by Das Kapital, the Communist Manifesto. He said that Marx wanted to convert the worker into the bourgeoisie. He wanted just to bring up the worker and turn it into a new form of the bourgeois. Whereas for Nietzsche, there was this radical sort of glorification of the station of the worker. He didn't want the worker to become wealthier, successful businessmen. He didn't want them to become this new form of bourgeoisie. He wanted this ideology of sacrifice for the nation, for the worker as a heroic figure, the one who does his duty. And so the, the ideology of the worker became sort of this ideology of a national worker, soldier, a political soldier figure. This ideology certainly had a large influence on the conservative revolution. It was crushed under national socialism. Uh, Nietzsche saw Hitler's socialism as sort of a facade, and in many ways Hitler betrayed socialism within his own party with the uh, death of the Strasser brothers, well, the death of uh, Gregor Strasser and his purging of the sort of socialist faction during the night of the long night. So I think Nikos was right in saying that Hitler's socialism was not a true socialism. It was a facade. And this idea of national Bolshevism also had another current in Russia with white Russians who were trying to reach white Russians, the czarist resistance against the Soviet Union, who eventually came to think that maybe they could go back to the Soviet Union and turn the Soviet Union into a nationalist power. Why? So they were... Because some of those original uh, white Russians, some of them actually joined up with the West. Yes, some of the white Russians did join up with the West. Uh, and they certainly, some of them joined with uh, Germany or like the Russian uh, National Liberation Army, et cetera. However, there, there was a faction of white Russians who advocated what they called an about faith, where they thought that they could take the Soviet Union and turn it into a nationalist thing. They said it was red on the outside, but white on the inside, like a radish. And eventually the Soviet Union, under Stalin, develops more nationalistic characteristics opposing Trotsky uh, international communism, uh, reaffirming the family, ending the feminism and support for gay rights that emerged uh, during the revolution, reestablishing links with the Orthodox Church, imposing a culturally conservative cultural policy in regards to art and music. So, all of these different factors, both the Russian National Bolshevik, Stalin's National Communism, and German National Bolshevism, later went on to influence this sort of second wave of National Bolshevism in Russia during the 90s, where you had a, a certain Weimar-esque situation in Russia during the 90s, where you had a nation brought to its knees by foreign powers, and the rich were selling out the country to the United States. They were becoming international oligarchs. And so you see people like Alexander Dugin and Edvard Limonov emerge out of this Russian national Bolshevik scene during the 90s, reasserting a Russian nationalism against capitalism, against the oligarchs who had sold out the nation. And this current later feeds into the fourth political theory, which combined an attack direct on liberal capitalism with a reassertion of the traditional identities of all the peoples of the world in large geopolitical civilizational blocks. So this fairly obscure ideology is now taking on a great importance uh, because you see this 
rise of Russia as a national bloc. So right now, I would say that it's necessary for the American new right to sort of open up their mind to these obscure currents of the past because they're becoming very relevant and very real. Do you think that uh, these ideas could appeal to a significant number of leftists? I think they could appeal to the old left. The old left, with its primacy on class struggle, its rejection of capitalism, its sympathy for the worker, they were genuinely sympathetic to the conditions created by the industrial to the conditions under which the labor were toiled, created by the Industrial Revolution. So I think that there's people like sympathetic to unionism who advocate for actually economic justice, I think can be incorporated into the new right. I do not think that the new left has anything to offer Basically, the new left, it's an alliance between uh, neoliberal economics and uh, cultural leftism. Yes, and the sort of Foucauldian current, why Foucault, the sort of icon of the French new left, later developed a sympathy towards neoliberalism because he saw that capitalism could allow the ultimate freedom of social construction ultimate consumer choice implies ultimate social construction. You can buy your gender. You can buy your sexual identity. You can buy just whatever you please. And so this radical individualism preached by the new left is in perfect agreement with the radical individualism preached by capitalism. Uh, We're getting towards the end of the show, uh, so I'm going to have to wrap things up. We're just getting out of time. Uh, One more thing I'm like to uh, ask you, you, know, you, you mentioned earlier you live in New York City. Uh, yeah. Talk about uh, uh, what it's uh, your experience uh, living there, and what are your thoughts on the uh, city? I don't really have many huge complaints. It's a safe city. I mean, it's it's the ground zero of modern culture and modern liberalism. It's not any oasis of traditional thought, and it's sad. However, it's a lot of fun. I have friends. I enjoy a fairly pleasant life. I I don't think that my alienation from modern liberalism comes from any personal trauma. I just think that society we live in is absolutely unsustainable and destructive to the traditional culture, I think that we can enjoy a much higher standard of life by rejecting the fruits of modernity. And uh, is there there's sort of a debate, uh, do you have to reject modernity completely or can you sort of pick and choose the best of uh, both? Some people are very much who call themselves. There's people who call themselves traditionalist, and they're very much uh, ideological purist. And then there's people who can say you can you can who basically are traditionalist in the sense we're headed in the wrong direction, but they're not. They don't stress absolute uh, purity about it. I think that the enlightenment ideologically must be rejected outright. However, there are all every age has certain facets of it in it that are relics of a more glorious period. So there there are certain sentiments that can be taken and used to bring back the ancient values that we once based our lives upon. However the things that are peculiarly modern must be rejected outright. We must reject rationalism. We must reject this belief that sort of science and technology are the end-all and be-all. We must 
reject domination by capitalism. We must reject the uh, cultural upheavals of the 1960s. And we, we must reject also the cultural upheavals of the 19th century. I think there's a, a certain facet in the American right that thought everything was perfectly fine until 1960, but they failed to realize the roots of the cultural upheavals deeper than that. So uh, we're basically out of time, so I'd like to thank Eugene Monsalvet for being on the show. Yes, you're welcome. I enjoyed this experience. Uh, That's all we have for today's show, so uh, take care, and we'll be back with you next time.